Hello and welcome to another one of Mr. Lang's blogs. Today we're going to be talking about the antebellum revivalism and reform in America during the 18, uh, 19th century, during the 1800s. Now, this is primarily referred to as the great, Second Great Awakening period. Uh, the reason why is because there's a huge spiritual reform from within um, with many people. Again, a huge religious revivalism going on in the country. At the same time, there's also social reforms that are going on, including things like temperance, where they attempt to ban alcohol, um, asylum and penal reform, again, done by the one and only Dorothea Dix, um, abolitionism, the women's rights movement, and of course, education with Horace Mann. Now, one of the biggest things is when you have foreigners coming into this country, they're noticing this huge rise of popular religion. In fact, um, at least Alexis de Tocqueville says, in France, I had almost seen the spirit of religion, the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to each other. But in America, I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. Again, religion was the foremost of political institutions of the United States. Um, and that's in 1832. Now, the pursuit of perfection was another nickname for this. Um, there's going to be a lot of the benevolent empire forming in the United States as well. Um, and we're going to be going over all of that. Now, the Second Great Awakening had these revival meetings. And these revival meetings involved um, these preachers that were very dramatic in their delivery, but for good cause, because of course they wanted to get their message across and literally have listeners. Now at this point, Charles Feeney is one of the most famous ones um, with his soul-shaking conversions he would do. I mean, an onlooker once wrote that the ranges of tents, the fires reflecting lights, the candles and lamps illuminating the encampment, hundreds moving to and fro, the preaching, praying, singing, and shouting like the sound of many waters was enough to swallow up all the powers of contemplation. Again, that's how much uh, people got involved during um, these sermons. Now, another religious group is the Mormons that was headed by Joseph Smith at first. Now, the Mormons, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, again, went ahead and they basically went, you know, claimed that they would got these golden tablets and that Joseph Smith had went ahead and talked to God. Now, they had intense violence against them because, again, what's going to happen is the Mormons are going to start to say that the polygamy is acceptable, and that isn't acceptable in most of the other religions. Um, so a small section becomes polygamous, while another section um, still s remains monogamous. Um, and that is between Hiram Smith, Joe's brother, and Brigham Young. Now another um, one is the Shakers. Now the Shakers um, literally were a religious group that went ahead and literally thought they could just shake away the evil, and they would do that um, all together in big meetings. Now they went ahead and they actually made furniture, and there was a reason for that. They made furniture because, you know, the, these little communities, these little utopias, they need to go ahead and have some sort of um, money income, and they do that through different means. In this case, the Shakers did it through creative furniture. Also during this time, we're going to have the belief of transcendentalism, which is the belief that knowledge is found not only by observation of the world, but through reason, intuition, and personal spiritual experiences. And the two people who go ahead and do that the most is, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. They are some of the most famous transcendentalists. Um, they're going to create this transcendentalist poetry. In fact, Henry David Thoreau is going to be as going to go as far as for two years live on Walden Pond off the land in a shack uh, away from everyone because again their belief was to reject all secular authority and authority of organized churches and laws and so on and have the role of the reformer restore man to the divinity which God had endowed them. That's their belief. Their agenda basically was give freedom to the slaves, give well-being to the poor, give learning to the ignorant, health to the sick, and peace and justice to society. The problem is Again, you're going to have people like Nathaniel Hawthorne who are going to be critics of this and say, you know what, people need to start accepting the world as an imperfect place, something transcendentalists weren't about to accept. Now, these utopian communities are going to show up everywhere um, throughout the United States. One is the Juanita community, which they were actually um, believed in all residents marrying each other. Um, again, they actually went ahead and used silverware as their way of getting money. Um, George Ripley is going to do is going to create Brook Farm over in West Roxbury, Massachusetts. Here, um, and Robert Owen is going to be the most famous with his utopian society, his New Harmony Society. He's the 
epitome of the utopian socialist or the village of cooperation. Um, now these are the original plans for New Harmony, Indiana, which is pretty interesting as you can see um, because it actually did come to fruition. It was, it did happen. In fact, this picture's there now. You can go there and you can see New Harmony. It's still there today, which is kind of cool. Um, now the penitentiary reform was important as well. You can have Dorothy Dix who goes ahead and reforms the asylums around the country after seeing the horrible conditions in both the prisons and the mental asylums because of course um, a lot of times they would take the mentally ill and simply throw them in prison so they'd have food and roof over their head but they weren't getting the care that they needed Dorothy Dix goes ahead and creates her asylum to keep them where they would get the treatment that they needed and they did um, the other movement is the temperance movement in uh, America at this point where demon rum was taking over Again, in 1826, they formed the American Temperance Society, which basically tried to ban alcohol. And the Beecher family and Francis Willard are two of the most famous uh, groups that tried to do it. Um, now, the annual consumption of alcohol had increased dramatically um, during the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, as you can see on the graph. Um, and because of this, this whole movement starts to become, you know, very, very famous, very big. Now. There was much propaganda about this, including the most famous, the Drunkard's Progress. Now, the Drunkard's Progress is interesting because, of course, it's clearly propaganda where it is, you know, over-exaggerated. But, at the same time, it was meant to scare people. And often, again, women especially, because, when, you know, it was very common for a man to go out for a drink, come back, and if he was drunk, you know, he could beat the, his wife. And unfortunately, nothing could be done about it because, of course, you, the police really would side with the man. It was a different world back then. So another thing was prostitution as well was reformed. Again, the fallen woman, Sarah Ingram, um, advocates that basically, you know, prostitution needs to go away. Um, we also had educational reform. Again, math always on the forefront of public education. We're the first state to establish a tax to support local public schools. Um, and by 1860, every state offers free public um, education to whites. Now, the man who does all this, the man who pioneered the public education, is Horace Mann from Franklin, Massachusetts. He's the father of American education. Again, some of his most famous sayings were that children were clay in the hands of teachers and school officials, and that children should be molded into a state of perfection. Um, he also discouraged um, the use of corporal punishment and established state teacher training programs as well including the Bridgewater Normal School, which we now know it as Bridgewater State University. Let's see, another one for you. Oh, the cult of domesticity. Now this is also something that's very interesting because this is very big during this era as well. It's the belief that the woman's fear was in the home and it was a refuge from the cruel world of outside. So she, her real role was to civilize her husband and family. Um, now the early 19th century woman was unable to vote had the legal status of a minor, um, was a single could own her own property, but the second she got married, she had no control over her property or even her children. Um, she could not initiate the divorce, and if there was a divorce, the man would get the children, and couldn't make will, sign a contract, bring suit in court without her husband's permission. Again, women did not have any say, unfortunately, and this is just, again, a black mark in our history. Um, of course, a propaganda ca cartoon, of course, that ladies had their own rights. Now the Cult of domesticity was sometimes, um, you know, interlaced with slavery because they both were seen as, you know, a lot of them had the same reformers and both were seen as being put down. Um, and there really was a second of great awakening that inspired women to improve society overall, including the Grimke sisters and Lucy Stone. Now the women's rights meet in 1848 at the Seneca Falls, New York, at the Seneca Falls Convention, um, and they make the Declaration of Sentiments. Now the Declaration of Sentiments is actually pretty incredible. It's a declaration of independence, but reworded in a way for women to declare their independence from men. Um, altogether, there were 300 people in attendance, women and men, which is always interesting because, of course, 32 of the men who actually signed the document of the 100 um, were men. And, of course, the most best line from it is that all men and women are created equal. Cool, the abolitionist movement's going on during this time as well. Um, one of the biggest abolitionists was William Lloyd Garrison, who went ahead and uh, wanted immediate emancipation with no compensation, saying, free the slaves, and there shouldn't be any compensation for the South. And he starts the most famous newspaper, The Liberator, which is 
incredibly huge during the during the time. Now, one of the biggest black abolitionists was Frederick Douglass. Um, he was actually very, very, very outspoken. He himself was a slave, and he was a runaway slave, and ran away here to Massachusetts and became, you know, a, I believe either a fisherman or a whaler here in New Bedford. Um, what ends up happening is, of course, you know, he's very outspoken about what he's seen and that he really does want emancipation for the slaves, again, for them to be free. Um, he does this through things like the Fourth of July speech that he makes that's so famous, um, as well as the North Star, one of his most famous publications. Now, Harriet Tubman, she helped 300 slaves to freedom as well, and she's very famous for this. Alrighty, and that's all you need to know. Um, there's the terms you need to know for the test, a couple of other things we went over. Um, you guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in class.